All right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so we will get started by going over those um, uh, practice problems from class. And then uh, we'll talk about this week's lab assignment, which is basically, it's going to tie together um, some equations that we had back in Gen Chem that we never really used that much in the eye of distillation. We're basically going to um, use Excel to simulate um, doing a distillation at various temperatures and sort of it'll allow us to do things like predict what the boiling point is for a mixture of two different liquids. Because remember the boiling point of two of two different liquids is not going to be the same as your regular boiling point of either of the two liquids because both of those two liquids are a solution and that solution has boiling point elevation properties. Um, so rather than just use the standard boiling point elevation equation, which doesn't take into account, that only works if we're talking about a non-volatile solute. Um, in other words, a solute that doesn't evaporate. Um, so if we have two different volatile compounds mixed together, we have to get a little bit more creative with our math. Well, not really that much more creative. We have to get more rigorous with our math um, and go all the way back to enthalpy of vaporization um, as a way to figure out, to predict things like vapor pressures um, with different mole fractions and things like that. And that'll allow us to apply some of those math concepts and predict some things for distillation um, that normally we wouldn't be able to predict or at least uh, up until this point, you would not have been able to predict. So, but let's start with this, with these practice problems. Um, so a reminder, we're looking for, um, if we have a nucleophile, we're looking at doing a nucleophilic substitution with these um, acid derivatives. If we have a reducing agent, like a hydride source or an um, alkylating source, then we're looking at, at adding an R group or adding a hydrogen hydride. And let me get my tablet up so I can draw some of these things. So if we're looking at 19A, so in this case, our um, we have starting with um, benzoic anhydride, and we're going to be replacing the anhydride section with um, with the oxygen from the phenol. So we're going to be making an ester. So that's going to look like Something like that. So our final product here. And we're just going to kick off the leaving group, reform the carbonyl. So we'll wind up with this as one of our products. And we actually do wind up with benzoate as our secondary product. So that was our leaving group up here, actually, including the acetic anhydride oxygen. So that's our leaving group, it's drawn in blue over there. And our new product is the phenyl benzoate ester.
right, if we're looking down below, we have an anhydride and an alcohol. So once again, this is very similar to the reaction just above it, except that now we have our alcohol drawn as our product. But the same general principle is going to apply. We're going to wind up with one of the acetate groups leaving. And the alcohol is going to come in here and attach to the other carbonyl. So once again, we're going to be making an ester. We're just going to have the carbonyl on the opposite side this time. Um, none of the methyl groups or T-butyl groups are affected by this. So we're going to wind up with that and the acetate left over. Hang on. All right. And so again, identifying what pair of electrons is moving where, what's your nucleophile and where's the carbonyl we're attaching it is the tricky part. And then just making sure you don't lose any carbons along the way. Uh, as long as we have screen set up this way, let's do 22A and D. So if we have an ester, and we're exposing it to excess lithium aluminum hydride. So we're going to be fully reducing it. So we're going to wind up turning this into a primary alcohol. So these carbons all stay where they are. We've reduced that all the way to the primary alcohol and then plus the methanol. that was part of the um, ester to begin with. If we have a, if we're starting with an ester and instead of having a reducing agent, we just have an acid, our nucleophile is actually going to be the oxygen here. We're gonna be converting the ester into an acid and an alcohol. Um, if we we're actually drawing the uh, mechanism, we would start by protonating the carbonyl there. So we'd wind up making this protonated form here. And then we have water come in. Can attach here, break the carbonyl group. So our net result here is going to be that after we make that tetrahedral intermediate, we're going to kick off one of kick off the eth ethoxy group. Um, as an acid, we're gonna have to have some proton transfer steps in here. So our net result is gonna wind up being cyclohexane carboxylic acid and ethanol. A zoom really does not like it when I draw too fast with my um, my stylus. It's all sorts of weird. Much better. All right, if we go up to B above, we've got the anhydride in excess. 
we're going to wind up breaking apart this anhydride and converting it to the amide. So our nucleophile is the nitrogen. We're replacing the acid leaving group with the um, nitrogen. So we're going to wind up making one molecule here, and then the other piece of this. So if that's our red um, side of the molecule, initially this is gonna get, the blue side is just going to be the deprotonated acid form. But if we have excess of the amine, we'll wind up turning that to the amide as well. So we broke up our acid anhydride into two pieces, one of which immediately was an amide, and the second of which also turns into amide if you have the excess nitrogen nucleophile. Right, so we wind up with this getting replaced and also being turned into All right, and just for grins, if we are going to name this molecule, remember with these amides, we mostly just stick amide onto the end of the base name. Um, so our base molecule for these would be three carbons long. So it would be propan amide. And then we have those two ethyl groups that are both on the nitrogen. So it would be N, N, diethyl. Just a reminder that when we have things attached to the nitrogen, we just, instead of using a number, the numbers are reserved for carbons. So if we have something attached to a nitrogen, we just use N as our indicator of where it is. All right, and once again for D, we've got a secondary amine once again. Naming this one would be much more, um, would be trickier. There's a special rule for naming amides where the nitrogen is part of a ring structure. We're not going to get into that for right now. Um, we're just going to wind up breaking apart our anhydride, putting a nitrogen where are attached to both of the carbonyls. We take the acetic anhydride and turn it into. And I did not give myself enough. Wind up with two molecules of this, right? Which incidentally, if we were going to build it, just for the sake of checking what the name is. So that doesn't actually wind up helping because they're naming it. So this, this cyclohexane um, group with the nitrogen in there is a molecule known as piperidine. Um, so it's naming it as acetyl piperidine. Um, so it's not actually naming it as the amide, it's naming it using a common name. So that doesn't really help us solve that. Um, all that to say is that these, these structures um, with the nitrogen as part of a ring structure um, are fairly complicated uh, and don't, aren't worth learning the specifics of the IUPAC naming because so many of them are gonna wind up having um, common names.
All right, any questions so far? B e and E down here are going to be a little bit um, a little bit different. We have excess ethyl magnesium bromide. So that's going to tell tells us we're going to be doing a um, we got a Grignard reagent. So we're going to be reducing by adding those R groups. So all of those carbons stay where they are. That oxygen gets turned into an OH, and then we're adding ethyl groups to the carbon that has the oxygen attached, plus whatever was on the other side of our ester, so plus methanol. <coughs> Excuse me. I've been, I've been, uh, I got roped into coaching a um, T-ball team, not T-ball, one level up from T-ball. So we're on the dirt field. Um, and you would not believe how much dirt seven-year-olds can kick up on a baseball field and how much, how uh, loud you have to be while wearing a mask to get them to run from first base to second base. So my throat's a little raspy today. I apologize. <clears throat> it is a lot of fun though they had their first coach pitch game last night and that was a lot of fun put a little stress on me but I only hit one kid with a pitch so that's not so bad it was better than the other coach I'll put it that way all right so if we have e we're going to go about this a little bit differently if we had hydroxide acting as our nucleophile, we would wind up making something that's exactly what we started with. Because if we, if we had a hydroxide attack there and make a tetrahedral intermediate, where our leaving group is still a hydroxide either way. And so that doesn't really take us anywhere. Hydroxide is a nucleophile, but in this case, it's a nucleophile that's going to give us exactly what we started with. So that can't be the mechanism. So the other thing that hydroxide can do is it can deprotonate the acid and turn the acid into a nucleophile. So after step one, step one is just deprotonating our carboxylic acid group. So we'll wind up with a benzoate. And that's now got a negative charge. So that's a nucleophile that can attack if we have ethyl iodide. We can do a quick SN2 substitution. And we're going to wind up bumping that iodide off and replacing it with our est um, and making an ester. So our final product here would be. ethyl benzoate, right? So slightly different mechanism because we're using, um, we're gonna wind up using the deprotonated acid as the nucleophile, um, just the same way that a, the, a deprotonated acid could be a leaving group, like up here when we had the acid anhydrides, if it can be a leaving group, um, where it's bringing its electrons with it, it could also be a nucleophile under different conditions. So we're just making it a nucleophile by deprotonating it and then using that to, to push off the iodide, which is an even better leaving group. So that one's a little bit tricky of a mechanism, but it's not that bad. So for C, 
got a little bit of a ring opening reaction and we are we have the hydride source so we're going to be reducing this carbon all the way to an alcohol we just have to keep track of since we're starting as a ring structure we also have to make sure that we keep track of the rest of the molecule so our first intermediate um, and again, this is one of those where you would not have to draw the intermediate, but it might be helpful for keeping track of things, would look like would look like this, where our hydride comes in and attaches to the carbonyl carbon, makes a tetrahedral intermediate, and then our leaving group leaves. And our leaving group in this case. is the ester oxygen. And then we reform the carbonyl. So our first step is gonna turn this ester into an aldehyde. And an alcohol. Technically we haven't done the proton transfer step yet. So this is not an alcohol. It's just going to be an oxygen with a negative charge. So we have split that ring structure up like that. And now that we now that we see what that looks like, we can rearrange it in a more convenient way to draw it in a straight line if we want. It's an aldehyde that's one, two, three, four, five carbons and an oxygen on carbon five. So our intermediate. We rearrange it a little bit. It's going to look like it's our aldehyde, carbon one, two, three, four, five. And then our excess hydride says the next thing that happens is hydride attacks here again. And then step two is just going to protonate both of those alkoxy ions. So we're going to wind up with one five pentane, pentane diol as our final product here. All right, so nothing, again, this should start getting repetitive. We're just sort of adding new wrinkles and seeing as many different possibilities as possible to get you nice and comfortable with it. But it, if it feels repetitive right now, it's because it is. And then we have something similar for F but it's gonna be a little bit trickier to keep track of everything. We still are gonna wind up breaking our molecule apart here. And this carbon that I'm circling in blue, that's gonna wind up getting two ethyl groups added to it and converting that oxygen to an alcohol. The other alcohol is gonna stay as a primary alcohol. So. Um, so our benzene ring is not changing. The top half here is going to turn into, and it's two ethyls. And I could draw those in a more convenient way. Then down below, we had two carbons on the one that I initially circled in blue. Um, actually, I think I switched colors here. But so the blue part of the molecule down here, we have two carbons and then an OH.
right? So turns into a big complicated looking um, molecule. But part of the reason for that is we added two ethyl groups. That's gonna make anything look a lot more complicated, right? Um, adding two ethyl groups to the same carbon is going to make that carbon look like it's a mess. <clears throat> But if we ignore those two ethyl groups that we added, if we ignore those, we should have the same number of carbons. And we can look at these and say, OK, if that carbonyl carbon was one, two, three, four, five, the oxygen was the sixth piece of the ring to begin with. So we do still have the six pieces that were in a ring are all still there, just drawn differently. Sorry, Sean. Um, I have a question about C. I was looking at um, the mechanism because you kind of drew out the mechanism for C, and I was kind of confused. Mm -hmm. You had a lone pair of electrons on the oxygen with the single bond um, from the carbonyl. Um, I didn't know how you got to that. So if we have a hydride coming in and attaching here, we have to make room for it, for starters, by breaking that oh. carbonyl bond. So initially, our intermediate still looks like the ring structure, but now we've got oxygen. Is that the negative charge you're talking about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So just then, it's just the pi electrons before it reforms into the aldehyde. Okay, and then the um, the bond between the carbonyl carbon and the oxygen, uh, it, the electrons go onto the oxygen on the right. Correct. Okay. All right. So we do that and then you for said, starters. And then you said another hydride um, attacks the the carbonyl again. Correct. So it's still a good target for a car for a hydride because it's still this this um, carbonyl carbon still has a partial positive, and we still have a pi bond, and pi bonds are almost always less stable than sigma bonds. So okay. if we have a partial positive there and we still have in the excess lithium aluminum hydride, we still have more hydride around that can just come in here and do the same thing again. Okay, all right, thank you. No problem. All right, and then the, <clears throat> the mechanism would look exactly the same for F just with an ethyl group coming in with a negative charge to be our nucleophile instead of a hydride. <clears throat> You'd have it okay. come in, make a tetrahedral intermediate, and then you would break apart this bond here and reform the, the um, carbonyl. And then you have a second ethyl group coming in and doing it again. So when the first ethyl group comes in and attacks it, does it already eliminate the pi bond? Yeah, so it'll start by breaking the pi bond, and then it's going to reform the pi bond so that the oxygen doesn't have an extra pair of electrons. So and you'll start with, yeah, if we have an ethyl with a negative charge, so if we start here, the ethyl is going to come in here. And once again, you're going to break that apart and make an intermediate that looks like a tetrahedral carbon where the carbonyl carbon is right now. Okay. So then, so at that point, it's still, and I'm not, I'm not drawing the benzene ring just to end the interest of, um, of saving space and time. So our first intermediate on F would look like this. And okay. then once again, you, you've got a good leaving group so that oxygen right. can leave and reform the carbonyl. And then the second ethyl group comes in and does it again. And so that's where there's diethyl. Exactly. Right. All right, thanks. No problem. Yeah, these, these reducing react mechanisms are really the same as the reductions of the aldehydes and ketones from chapter 19. We're just adding a step, a first step where we um, are going to break the carbonyl and then reform it. And then we attack it again. Any other questions on the, on the, the uh, reactions we've gone over so far? I know we did a ton of volume today, but again, 
it's only different superficially. For the most part, the reactions are all the same, just with different nucleophiles and different starting functional groups. And that first slide of that review slide, this winds up being important when it comes to predicting which side is favored at equilibrium, right? The most reactive are the ones on the left. So anything that's on the left can be turned into anything to the right of it. Any of the more reactive groups, we can turn into any of the less reactive groups just by supplying a nucleophile. Because our leaving groups, the further to the left you are on this diagram, our leaving groups are better leaving groups. They're weaker bases. All right, and so there were a couple more practice reactions um, that were a little bit different. These are the ones that are specific to amides um, on the ones on the left are. Um, if you expose an, am an amide to a hydride source, we're not going to make the alcohol we make the amine. A carbon-nitrogen bond um, is, is a little bit more stable than a carbon-oxygen bond. So we wind up actually with that oxygen winds up leaving. And we wind up replacing the two carbon-oxygen bonds with carbon-hydrogen bonds. So the, the nothing happens to the nitrogen. We just plug in a couple of hydrides where the oxygen was attached. All right, and that's really the, the amide is the only one that will do that. The rest of these acid derivatives, when you expose them to excess lithium aluminum hydride, you just turn them into an alcohol. But the amide, the nitrogen is such a bad leaving group that you wind up being able to remove the oxygen and replace it with hydrogens. Whereas all of the other acid derivatives had much better leaving groups. And so you left an oxygen on there um, and turned it to the alcohol. I have a quick question. So if this in this instance, if it was like a ring, say, for example, that methyl coming out of, uh, I guess, position two, or yeah, um, if that was connected to like the nitrogen in like a ring, it wouldn't, this wouldn't cause it to open the ring, right? No, not in this case, because those carbon, that nitrogen is such a bad leaving group, you won't wind up um, with that happening in this case. Um, okay, you would so have to do something else to get to do that okay so in this instance um the the double bonded oxygen would just become would just be replaced by hydrogen still exactly okay yeah the the for amides you don't really see ring opening reactions nearly as much unless you're doing something there's really only a couple of reactions that can convert um, an amide to something else um, so if we had, um, if you add a lot of heat and H3O plus, you can wind up with the nitrogen leaving. So in that case, so if we had a cyclic amide, like we've been practicing with, if we had this plus H3O plus and heat, we can get that reaction to go. And what will happen is the nitrogen will be a good, um, can be a good enough leaving group. And basically just by 
by using Le Chatelier's principle and driving equilibrium to the right. These would normally be an equilibrium that favors making the amine, but you can break that bond up if you have a whole lot of acid and heat, which incidentally is about what your stomach does to proteins. When you eat proteins, proteins are a bunch of amino acids linked with um, amide bonds, right? Your stomach is super acidic to try and drive the equilibrium towards one, denaturing the protein so that they unfold, and two, breaking apart the, the peptide bonds and turning them into their individual amino acids as much as possible. So this can be done, um, but even that still needs help, right? Your stomach has, a, has an enzyme called pepsin um, that, is, that is adapted to work at soup, in a super acidic environment to help break up a lot of these amide bonds. So even then, you still need help getting these things to break apart, even in something as acidic as, um, as stomach acid. And so um, this is really not all that common to have to break up an amide. This is about the only way you can do it is one, either reduce it to turn it into um, CH bonds, or with enough acid, you can get it to break apart. And in that, this case, we would wind up turning it into an amino acid, actually. Actually, one beta. We are one carbon off from this molecule in blue um, being GABA, um, which is stands for gamma amino butyric acid, because we have one, two, three, four, five carbons, not four carbons. Um, so it's really close to being the structure of a naturally occurring neurotransmitter that we that I picked just at random. Um, that uh, and that that one actually doesn't easily form a ring structure with itself, mostly just because it's a little bit more strained of a, of a um, molecule to have a five-sided ring compared to a um, six-sided ring here. So this would be a little bit less common and we'd be more likely to see it in the open chain form. So, and just as far as um, familiarizing you guys with a slightly old school, but more biochem way of naming things. Um, regular amino acids that you guys are used to seeing in biochem or in a biology class are alpha amino acids, where your amine group is on the alpha carbon relative to the carboxylic acid. So you have something that looks like a carboxylic acid, another carbon, and then an amine. And then you had you would have your R group and another hydrogen attached there. Um, so this is an alpha amino acid because one carbon away from the uh, carboxylic acid, that's your alpha carbon. So we call these alpha amino acids. GABA, which is a neurotransmitter, is gamma amino acid. So gamma, alpha, beta, gamma if you know your um, Greek alphabet, uh, it helps more to know your Greek alphabet in terms of the actual order of the letters rather than in terms of um, frat houses in this case. Um, so if you had GABA would be the acid, here's carbon one, alpha carbon, beta carbon, gamma carbon, right there. And that's a total of four carbons, right? So that's what the B in GABA is butyric acid, or which is the old school way of saying but butanoic acid. So this is um, GABA's structure. It would just be alpha, beta, gamma. And we'll get into actually next chapter. Um, it's talking a lot, turns out with carbonyls, alpha carbons um, are actually fairly reactive on their own because by being adjacent to a carbonyl. So we have a whole chapter on alpha carbon chemistry coming up um, soon. So just wanted you guys to be familiar with that style of nomenclature.
as well, as long as we're talking about it. <clears throat> All right, so B, um, we're just going to be converting this acid chloride into the amide. Our amide in this case is just ammonia, so it's not even a primary amine, it's just a nitrogen. So our product is just cyclohexanamide. And if we went through that hydrolysis reaction from C, if we took our cyclohexane, cyclohexane carbanamide, cyclohexane carbanamide, and expose it to excess acid and heat, we're just going to convert it to the acid form. plus the protonated uh, ammonia that we have here. All right, so for E and F, I'm not gonna go through all the steps right now, but just as a brief strategy for the synthesis problem, if we're trying to make an acetal, we only make acetals when we're starting from a, from a class two carbonyl, right? So what we need to do here is turn our benzoic acid into benzaldehyde. And then we can just expose it to ethylene glycol to make that acetal. All right, so we need to do a selective reduction where we're gonna turn it into the aldehyde, but not fully reduce it all the way to the alcohol. So that's gonna look like that L-I-A-L-O-R-3-H, that lithium trialkyl, trialkoxy, lithium aluminum hydride. With, um, that was our selective hydride source for everything but amides um, and esters. And that would convert it to benzaldehyde, which then you would just expose it to ethylene glycol and you would convert that aldehyde into the acetal. So little review with that one. This is a little bit trickier, I think, because we need to find a way to convert something. We're changing the carbon structure for starters. And then we need to make sure we're left with a carboxylic acid. So we need to, I would go back and look at oxidizing agents and see what we have that could do that. Um, we would, if we were just trying to make benzoic acid, there's plenty of ways we could cut it right here and turn it into a carboxylic acid. But to get it to cut on the second carbon away from the benzene ring is a little bit trickier. So we go back and double check that. You might, um, we know that we can make a carboxylic acid from, um, ozonolysis of an alkyne. So we might have to do something like turn this into an alkyne first. We might have to do something um, like turning this into an ester first. We could do something where if we, if we oxidized the alcohol to a ketone, we then had a reaction that could turn a ketone into an ester, right? And then we could can turn, can could turn an ester into a carboxylic acid. So that, remember that reaction with the peroxy acid with a ketone allowed you to basically stick an extra oxygen in between all the carbons. So we need to review our rules for migratory aptitude for that one, but you, I believe that's probably gonna be the fastest way to do this. In the fewest steps anyway, we could turn this into
ketone. And then from there into the ester. And I don't have enough room right there. And then you could take the ester and convert it to the acid, either through saponification or with the acid catalyzed reaction. All right. So I'm not going to go through the full what all of those reagents are, but those would probably, I believe that's going to be your fastest after thinking it through on the fly with you guys right here. Those are the reactions that are coming to mind from memory, memory that we could do that would turn an alcohol into the acid there. All right, so questions on this practice problems here. I think migratory aptitude even works too, because we have a T-butyl group on the right, and that tertiary carbon will migrate faster than the primary carbon on the other side. So we would wind up sticking the oxygen between the ketone that we made and the T-butyl group. So I think that that'd be, yeah. I not say that that's the only way, but I think that's the way in the shortest number of steps. All right, we've been going for almost 50 minutes now. How about we take a quick break and we come back and I'll, I'll introduce the lab real quick and give you some tips on how to do some of these calculations and then I'll turn you loose on it. So let's say, let's come back at two and we'll get started on the lab.
Uh, Cody, that was a, uh, a good find on that. And that, that actually matches up a little bit. Uh, I think we talked when we first talked about epoxides, about how that can happen to unsaturated compounds. If you have carbon-carbon pi bonds, especially if it's not in a benzene ring, you can wind up with epoxidation happening naturally if you expose it to oxygen. So if you look at the orbitals, so this is a paper that I don't have access to the, the full text, um, but they, they use some of the um, computational methods that we actually learned earlier this, this quarter. To look at the energy of bonding and anti-bonding orbitals as you bring oxygen as O2 up to an alkene, um, you can wind up with it forming an epoxide um, based on the orbital overlap. And so you do see this, especially, this is one of the reasons why a lot of essential oils, um, especially if they're high in terpenes, which are unsaturated compounds, um, that, but they're not aromatic generally. Um, so terpenes in general have a have a uh, unsaturated hydrocarbon, um, but they're not aromatic. So you wind up so things like limonene, um, alpha pinene, a lot of uh, things, a lot of essential oils that you see in um, hop oils in beer, um, wind up having these these carbon carbon pi bonds that. It, when exposed to oxygen, will react and make an epoxide, which then can go on to do other things. But generally speaking, you lose a lot of flavor um, and a lot of the scent of essential oils after they've been exposed to oxygen for an, for an extended period of time, mostly because of the epoxidation, because of this reaction right, right here. Um, and so you could also be seeing it as a result of your extraction process. If your extraction process um, is exposed to oxygen and you have these really high concentration essential oils, or if you're just, if they're not sealed well enough, um, then a lot of these essential oils will, will do similar reactions. Real aromatic molecules typically won't do that, not easily. They tend to have a better shelf life. Um, but that's why it's important to seal your stuff, minimize exposure to oxygen, also minimize exposure to UV light because UV will also break these down. Um, and just incidentally, for anybody else who's interested, um, so losing, if, you're, if you like hoppy beers, if they're exposed to a lot of oxygen, you lose a lot of those hop flavors. Um, but if you expose it to UV light, then you have a separate reaction happening, which is, I don't think it's technically an oxidation reaction, um, but that's what causes beer to, hoppy beer to go skunky. Um, if it starts smelling really skunky or, or you know, like weed after um, some exposure to light, that, is that, that reaction is a separate reaction that's also basically um, taking some of these aromatic compounds in your hop oils and causing them to, re to react. And if you've never experienced that before, um, up here at our altitude, the UV light is so strong that if you get a, a hoppy beer um, or even just um, like a, a Heineken in a clear glass and you put it, put uh, pour half of it into a clear glass and put it in the sun and leave the other one in the shade, the other half in the shade, um, you'll notice the difference in the smell and the taste in under five minutes you'll be able to tell the difference between the two of them because the sunlight is so bad for um, alpha acids and converts them into the skunky tasting and smelling compounds very quickly. Yeah, I was trying to find a research article that had to do with why LSD glows under ultraviolet light, just because that seemed interesting, but I couldn't really find much on that. But yeah, it definitely reacts with it for sure. Yeah, after after we introduce the the lab, um, I can maybe give you some um, some search terms that might be helpful um, because if you looked at um, because though that typically has to do with the how big your conjugation, how big your pi cloud is, how many pi electrons do you have that are all conjugated? The more pi bonds you have conjugated, um, the closer your orbital energies get to each other. Your homo and your lumo get closer and closer in energy. 
which is going to affect what wavelengths of light it will absorb and therefore emit. Um, and so we see that a lot with, with OLEDs and with day glow stuff is basically just tweaking how big a molecule is, how many pi electrons do you have um, conjugated. And so there might be something um, where you looked at biomolecules and conjugation as a way of, um, of doing that. So we'll, we can talk about that though afterwards. The lab doesn't seem to be loaded to Canvas. Let me double check that. Thank you, Elke. Um, I thought I checked it and saw it, but it's totally possible that I just haven't hit some. Um, haven't hit publish yet. Yep, that's my that's my bad. There, that one. I hit refresh, and you should be able to see it. All right, so this is going to be an Excel lab. No running extra calculations. Um, no, no games calculations or anything like that. Um, it is going to to bring back some of your um, knowledge. Knowledge might be the wrong word. Um, it's going to touch on some concepts we talked about in Gen Chem. You might not remember them, um, but there was we did have an, an equation that we called the um, Clausius Clapeyron equation um, that related vapor pressure to delta G for a specific liquid, uh, and this is actually tied to um, <clears throat> the more specifically. This is tied to um, that just our K equation, where we could say for any reaction, the equilibrium constant was equal to E to the minus delta G over RT. So it's the exact same expression. Um, the difference is when we're talking about a reaction that's as simple as something evaporating, evaporation, so if we had H2O as a liquid, in equilibrium with H2O as a gas. Well, what is the equilibrium constant for that reaction? Any thoughts? Any, anybody remember how to write equilibrium expressions? What's the first rule of equilibrium? Products over reactants, right? There we go. And second rule equilibrium was also products over reactants. But the third rule of equilibrium was you leave off solids and liquids. If it's a pure substance, you don't put it in the equilibrium expression, right? Because it was always a constant concentration. So for this reaction for um, of liquid water going to gaseous water, Kp, for this reaction is just pressure of H2O, your product, and then divided by one because you don't put the liquid included in there. So this expression right here is basically saying that if we're talking about something as simple as a evaporation or a phase change in general, if it's that simple of a chemical reaction, we can just say the vapor pressure of that of that compound that we're talking about is just equal to e to the negative delta g over rt. Okay, so maybe that's useful, maybe that's not. Um, it really gets help. It really gets useful if we rearrange this and we plug in our definition of delta g. So remember our definition of delta G was had the enthal enthalpy term. So that's our energy of the bonds breaking. And then there was the entropy term. And so enthalpy, change in enthalpy is how much your bond energies are changing. Delta S is your change in disorder or randomness. If we plug that that expression in for delta G, and we rearrange things a little bit, 
we can get this equation down here. Now, again, maybe that seems helpful, maybe it doesn't. Um, so far, all we've done is doing some algebra with, with an equation that we've seen before. Um, why this really winds up being useful is because it actually gives us where, a way to relate two things that we can measure with as a way to figure out what delta H and delta S for a reaction are. We can measure vapor pressure at various temperatures. And if we can measure the vapor pressure at different temperatures, we can calculate delta H in a way that's based entirely on, on measured numbers. Um, so we can get pretty good numbers for that delta H of vaporization that way. And on the flip side, if we know delta H and delta S, we can plug in a temperature and figure out what the vapor pressure is at any given point. All right, so that's going to wind up being helpful. The first thing we're going to do in this, um, in this lab is look up vapor pressures for water and ethanol at two different temperatures. And then we can use that to calculate delta H and delta S. So this is, um, if you, the two point form or the, um, also called the point, it's the point slope form uh, as well. If you um, remember your algebra, um, basically, if you have two data points, that's enough to figure out what the slope of a line is. Any two data points you can plug into and just use basic linear algebra um, to figure out the slope of a line. So that's what equation three is doing, is if you know two different vapor pressures at two different temperatures, you can calculate delta H. And if you can calculate delta H, you can plug it in for in equation two and you can find delta S. And now we have all of the pieces that allow us to pretty easily um, calculate some uh, a, a equation for a straight line. We have a slope and we have an intercept and now we have a relationship between temperature and vapor pressure for any given liquid. As long as you can get a vapor pressure at two different temperatures, you can find the vapor pressure at any other temperature for that liquid. All right, so, and the lab procedure will walk you through that a little bit. Um, but that's basically what you're doing for, for part one. You're using equations one and two to figure out the enthalpy of vaporization and the entropy of vaporization for two different liquids, for water and for ethanol. You're gonna start by looking up boiling points at two different pressures. Because the boiling point is when the vapor pressure is equal to the atmospheric pressure, right? You guys remember talking about that for phase changes? That's why water boils at a lower temperature up here, right? So if we know the boiling point of water at two different at two different pressures, we can plug that in those pressures in for P1 and P2 and plug the boiling points in for T1 and T2 and find delta H. Once you know delta H, you can find delta S. Watch your units on R because we're dealing with energy terms not liters and atmospheres. So you're not going to use your gas laws version of R. You're going to use the energy version of R, which is that joules per mole Kelvin units. All right, so that's all well and good. What does that have to do with anything? Um, this is going to... The second part of this is basically if you have a mixture of two liquids, 
we can say that that mixture will boil when the sum of the vapor pressures is equal to the atmospheric pressure. So when it's a pure liquid, we just say it boils when the vapor pressure is the same as atmospheric pressure. But if we have two different liquids mixed together, they're each going to have their own vapor pressure. And if they each have their own vapor pressure, then your mixture will boil when the sum of the vapor pressures is equal to atmospheric pressure. Right, so here is a, um, a sample plot that I did where I plotted vapor pressure of water and the vapor pressure of ethanol <clears throat> versus temperature. So I took that same equation we were just looking at and I plotted equation two with the, with the delta H that I found for water and the delta S I found for water. And you can plot that for, and you just basically are going to make up a bunch of temperatures. You start at a certain temperature, say zero Celsius, you could start at 273 and just add a whole bunch of data points where you say, okay, 273 Kelvin, 274 Kelvin, 275 Kelvin. And that's going to be your x-axis. And then from that, you can calculate the vapor pressure. Because if you know delta H and you know delta S, you can plug in temperature and it'll give you a function that looks like this. And so we see it for pure water. we can actually see, okay, the point where pure water hits one atmosphere for its, for its um, vapor pressure, that's the boiling point of pure water at sea level. And so if we track this straight down, you can see it's right at 373, so or 100 Celsius. Right, so what this graph is going to allow us to do, if, ignore the total one for right now, the gray one, is it allows us to predict the boiling point based on atmospheric pressure. Wherever your, your vapor pressure exceeds atmospheric pressure, drop a line straight down to your x-axis and that gives you your boiling point. So for ethanol, Ethanol hits one atmosphere of pressure right here. So if we drop a line straight down, you see that it's just under 353. 353 would be 70 Celsius, or sorry, it would be 80 Celsius. So this is going to be something between, say, 75 and, and 80 Celsius. Right? And at any other um, atmospheric pressure up here at altitude, we're at about 0.8 atmospheres. So we want to know the boiling point at our altitude. Drop a line straight down where these functions hit 0.8 atmospheres. Right? So kind of cool gives us a way to predict boiling point. What are we doing with this now? Where it really gets interesting is when you have a mixture of the two. If you have the mixture of two pure liquids, we can say that the total vapor pressure is going to be the sum of the pieces. So if we have a vapor pressure, a total vapor pressure is going to be um, the vapor pressure of water plus the vapor pressure of ethanol. And we also know that the vapor pressure of any compound, so by combining equation four and equation one, we can say that the um, the mole fraction of compound A 
this looks really intimidating, but bear with me. That's the mole fraction of compound A. This is the vapor pressure of A. Mole fraction of B and vapor pressure of B. So we have a way to calculate vapor pressure as a function of temperature for the pure substances. For the combined substance, all we're going to do is say the mole fraction times the rest of this the mole fraction in the mixture times the normal vapor pressure is going to be the, the modified vapor pressure, right? So to go back to Excel here, I'm just going to zoom in on one of these data points to explain what the calculations are doing. It's basically, if you have delta H and delta S for your compounds, those are going to be constants. For a specific temperature, we can get the vapor pressure of pure ethanol. And the equation for that is just going to be um, the clausius clapeyron equation that we just went over. This one right here, equation two. So we can do that for ethanol. We can do that for water at a given temperature. If we want to know the total vapor pressure, the total vapor pressure is going to be the vapor pressure of ethanol times the mole fraction of ethanol. The mole fraction of ethanol is going to be given to you in the initial reaction condition. So it's actually it's calculated down here initially um, in, in the way I have my spreadsheet set up. So mole fraction of ethanol times the vapor pressure of ethanol plus the mole fraction of water times the vapor pressure of water at that temperature. So your total vapor pressure is going to be the sum of the pieces. So in terms of being able to look at this chart, this gray line is our total vapor pressure for one of, for a certain mixture, for starting conditions of, um, what did I start, have it start at? For a mixture, that is 15% alcohol by volume. So you have to do a little problem solving to turn ABV into mole fraction. But if you can do that, you can wind up with this gray line. And this gray line will allow us to predict the boiling point of a mixture. And it'll also allow us to predict the mole fraction of the vapor the mole fraction of the vapor is not the same as the mole fraction of the mixture. That's how distillation works. Is that the vapor is going to have more of the ethanol in it than the, than the mixture you started with because the ethanol evaporates easier. Right? So basically, I know none, none of this is basic. This is all fairly convoluted. But for a specific distillation, you can, um, you can say, okay, if I'm trying to find the boiling point of this mixture at one atmosphere at sea level, it's going to be the point where the total vapor pressure is equal to one atmosphere. So once we have these, this um, table made or we have this chart made, you go up to where you find one atmosphere of the mixture and drop your line straight down. And it's going to be a little bit less than 100 Celsius. Or more quantitatively, on your spreadsheet, you go down this column right here until it gets to one atmosphere. If we just scroll down this, it should be somewhere around 100 Celsius. The point where we get to one atmosphere of pressure that's our boiling point for this mixture, right? Because that's where the 
vapor pressure of the mixture is equal to the atmospheric vapor pressure. All right, so this is a somewhat tricky lab. Your, your spreadsheet's not gonna start out looking like this. Your spreadsheet's gonna start out blank as usual. And you're just gonna start by making yourself an X an X axis. You're just gonna start by adding temperature. So say we're starting from zero Celsius, which is so temperature and we need this in Kelvin. So you're just gonna start by filling in and we can just do it plus or minus one degree. We don't need to go any more detail than that. Or we could make this as many data points as we wanted. So you're just gonna make 273, 274, 275. And you're just gonna extend that down till you get to three something, 383 is fine, or 373, since we know it's gonna boil before 100 Celsius. And then you're just gonna, you're going to use some of the values that you calculated to figure out your vapor pressure of ethanol at each of these temperatures. So that's what the rest of these um, data points, all this, all these constants off to the left on mine is me using some boiling points at different temperatures and different pressures that I looked up to figure out delta H and delta S. Once you know delta H and delta S, you can turn around and plug that into your equation here to figure out your vapor pressure. That's gonna be based on two constants and whatever temperature you're at. Right, so you're just going to write at, in an equation once where you're, and it's going to be based around the same. Here, let me. It's going to be based around the same equation we looked at a second ago. Right here, you're going to use this equation. Actually, you're going to use this form of the equation to plug in and get vapor pressure as a function of the temperature. So you have E, your vapor pressure for ethanol is equal to E to the negative delta H over RT plus delta S over R. You're just plugging in this equation. Actually, it's sort of a hybrid of the two equations. Um, that looks would look more like um, if we just took our definition of G and, and plugged it in here. So your equation you'll actually plug into Excel will look like vapor pressure equals E in the short in um, Excel, EXP is the function for E to a power. Negative delta H over RT minus delta or plus delta S over R. Delta H, delta S, and R are all constants. So the only variables in here is T. So as a function of temperature, you can predict vapor pressure. Right? And that's what you're actually going to plug into Excel. All right. If I kept going more on the process here, um, then I feel like I would just confuse you further. I'm going to let you start working on this. Um, and when you get to the later um, questions, um, ask me ask me about it. So the 
you have everything you need. Well, you will after you look up some boiling points and some densities to, to do one and two, to get all the way to your first set of data here. Um, and therefore get to this chart. You don't have to do this chart right away. I don't know if it has you plot the chart or not. I don't remember. Um, but you have everything you need to start working on this chart for your first distillation. And then when you get to number three, and we might make this a two week lab. I'm gonna look at what we have scheduled for lab next week. Um, you can get through number three and you have the tools to do number four as well, but you might need a little bit of help breaking down my writing here and turning it into something you could actually use. Um, and then you're just gonna repeat it. You're gonna say, okay, here's what happens when you do one distillation. And then you're gonna take your results from your first distillation and you're gonna plug that in as your new mole fraction for your second distillation and do the same thing. So, so it looks like a big convoluted chart and it is a big convoluted chart, but distillation two and three are the same thing we, that you did already. You're just doing it again with a different starting point, a different starting mole fraction. Okay. All right. I'll let you guys start working on this. Let me know when you run into issues, um, especially if it's an Excel issue that's just a formatting thing. Just let me know. I can probably help you with that. Uh, Sean, just straight off the bat, I don't know if this is a dumb question, but um, I'm not really good at Excel, but can you show us how to like set up an equation so we don't have to like do the yeah, whole so thing? the Yeah, so if we know, I'm just going to copy and paste some of my um, constants here so I can walk you through it. So you would actually have to calculate these yourself. Um, but if you, once you've gotten your delta H and your delta S for the various components, if you wanna know the vapor pressure of ethanol at this particular temperature, we're going to use that. Let me go back to having split screen here. We're using this equation right here. So we're trying to, if we want to plug that in, any equation, anytime we want Excel to do anything other than just keep track of a number, you just start by writing equals. Okay. Remember that that's Excel's key to that you're you're telling it to do some math or telling it to use a certain program or something like that. Um, I mentioned it before, but I'll say it again. If we want to do e to a power, in Excel, you do that by typing EXP and then opening parentheses. That's the same thing as saying E to E caret, E to a power. And then everything else that's in this section over here, we just want to be plugged in there. So we could do um, so negative delta H. And let me rewrite this again. Where did I just put my... So we're trying to write, rewrite negative delta H over R T my plus delta S over R. All of that is gonna be inside our parentheses here. So delta H for ethanol is a constant. It's written over here. And then the bottom half of our equation is R times temperature and R in energy units is 8.314 times our temperature cell. So when we copy and paste this, we want the temperature to change when we copy and paste it. We want all of them to reference the temperature right next to it. So, that gives us our first term, that gives us the delta H over RT, or negative delta H over RT. Um, and then it's gonna be plus delta S over 
three, one, four, that R term again. So all, when we plug all that in there, you can type in Excel basically works just like a calculator once you tell it to do math. You need to know a few of the tricks like EXP is the, is the um, command to do E to a power. But the rest of this is just like typing it into a calculator. We when we hit enter, we're going to get uh, a number here. And the advantage of doing this in Excel is that now we have, we have over 100 data points. We don't want to type that in 100 times. So we can copy and paste that into everything that has a temp temperature next to it. And that's going to give us this. Um, that's going to copy and paste our formula for each of these. Except that you might notice we have a bunch of ones here. And if we click in and look at it, it highlights which cells it's referencing. It's referencing the temperature, which is good, but it's also referencing these two random empty cells where it's supposed to be delta H and delta S. So we have to change our formula just a little bit. I'm just going to delete all of this now. Anything that we want to keep constant. So for instance, we don't want our delta H to change. When we copy and paste this, we want our delta H is going to be in the same box all the time, in the same cell. So when we want to keep a cell constant, if you have a keyboard that has F4, you can just push the, um, the button F4 on your keyboard and it'll put in two dollar signs. Those dollar signs are just um, Excel's way of saying, hey, don't change this one. When I copy and paste, keep this one constant. Okay. And so the other one that we want to do that for is the Delta S. Delta S, right? So, and if you don't have F4 on your keyboard, you can just type in the dollar signs by hand a dollar sign before the B and a dollar sign before the seven or wherever your numbers wind up being. And now when we copy and paste, we wind up no matter which of these squares we click, the temperature is changing along with the cell, but the Delta H and the Delta S are not. Okay, all right, perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. No problem. That and that's probably a good refresher for everybody anyway, since you may have forgotten that. Elke, did you have a question? Yeah, it's kind of a dumb one, but um, how, how did you, how did you copy and paste all of your temperatures? Um, or, because I know you didn't handwrite those in. <laughs> so two ways you can do that is one, if you put a, the first few of them in um, by hand, like so if I start by writing, you just clear them all. If I start by writing 273 and then 274 and 275, if you put in the first few data points, if you then select them, then you can just copy or use that uh, click on that bottom right corner and drag it down. And it basically can interpret, oh, you're trying to add one every time. Okay. And it just does that for you. Um, the way that's even better because the reason, the problem with that is that you're still relying on Excel to think for you, which is always dangerous. Um, the other way you can do it is by making a recursive relationship, which is basically saying, okay, telling Excel, take the data point right above you and add one to it. Okay. And now when you, if you copy and paste that formula, For all of these, it's just referencing the cell immediately above it. And so it's just adding one every time. And that actually gives you the ability to make it whatever change you want. If I wanted to change it by 0 .0 0 0.1, I could do that too. And now I'm going up by a tenth every time instead of a whole degree every time. Mm -hmm. OK, thank you. No problem. And that trick right there is what is um, 
mathematician, it's it's one of those, it's like a clickbait title. Um, mathematician, mathematicians hate this one easy trick. Um, you do not need to take differential equations if you know how to do this with Excel. Because as long as your data points are close enough together, you don't need to use calculus to do it. You can just approximate it by using whatever the number was last time and making a tiny adjustment to it. Um, so that actually allows you to get around having to do a lot of complicated calculus or really complicated functions later on in, in your careers. Like Matt Mims got me in trouble with the math department because I told him that and then he immediately dropped Diffie Q and Bruce was mad at me.
Hey, Sean. Um, yeah. So I'm just starting to work through um, these problems. And um, so I need to get my pressure in millimeters pure mercury, right? Or so to get your um to get your delta h value initially if you're using the two the two point form if you're using equation three it doesn't matter what units you use for pressure as long as they're the okay. same okay i wasn't i wasn't i will so sh i should use equation three then not one and two yeah so so equation three is going to work the best for getting delta h Okay. Um, and then once you get delta H and delta S, the vapor pressures you're going to calculate are going to be in mercury or are going to be in atmospheres um, because it basically goes from zero to one, one being one atmosphere. Mm -hmm. um, that's just the, the way the units wind up working out normally. Okay. If you're using equation two, the vapor pressure, you want it to be in um, atmospheres. Okay. So I need to change it from feet to atmospheres. Um, I mean, or I mean, once you get your initial vapor, uh, your initial delta H, you can, um, you know, if you look at that at that equation, P one over P two, the units on pressure are going to cancel out, right? Right. Okay. So it doesn't. Oops, that's the wrong thing. Um, so it doesn't really matter initially if you're using equation three as long as your units are consistent they can be whatever pressure units you want okay um but with that said it's not a bad idea to just have everything in atmospheres the whole time just for the sake of consistency right well i mean i just didn't know if um like the one website i went to like i just didn't know if feet was really a measurement of pressure <laughs> Which I don't think it is, but um, it it is. It's feet of mercury. Feet. Really? No, it's okay. Mercury, really. Okay, maybe. Well, I it don't depends know. on where you're getting oh. your numbers. Oh, uh, oh, wait, no, no, no. I, it, I also, I guess they also put it in um, millimeters of mercury as well. So maybe I'll just use that one then. There you um, go. Okay. And then um, I think that was, so just solve for delta H and then plug in to find delta S. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you.
Sean, I'm a little confused on the equations still. Yeah, no worries. What uh, what in particular? So um, I think I understand how to get delta H. And so we're just using, obviously, the, say, I used um, one atmosphere and two atmospheres. So, for, so P1 would be one and P2 would be two, right? And then temperature one and temperature two is the different temperatures. Okay, Correct. so I got that right. And then for the first equation though, what vapor pressure are we plugging in? And then what temperature are we plugging in? So either of them will work okay. as long as your as long as your it's pressure just... is in atmospheres. Um, okay. Then you should be you should be able to use to use either of them. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So when we're, uh, wait, the vapor pressure. Okay, so when we're um, using the equation one, what are we using for delta G? So you're gonna be using that, that expression. Um, you're basically using equation two where you do E to the power of both sides and that'll cancel out the natural log. So you'll have E to the, um, so it would look more like this. Oh, so equation two is the same as equation one, just like, okay. Exactly. Um, so delta H, negative delta H over RT plus delta S over T. Uh, over R, right? Or delta S over R? Oh, sorry, yeah, over R. Thank you. Okay, so. So I have my delta H. So if I plug in my delta H into that equation, but we have two unknowns, right? We have the P vaporization and the delta S that are unknown. So you're going to need to reuse one of the two data points that you used in equation three. You're going to reuse it to find delta S. So pick one of those data points, and then you know a vapor pressure and a temperature, and now you know delta H and R is a constant, so now you can find delta S. And so, frankly, actually, for, for finding, for doing that, the form that it's in of uh, equation two might be more useful. Uh, okay, well, I'm still kind of confused on how we find P vaporization. Like, would you, what do you mean by data points? So you found, you found the vapor pressure at two different temperatures, right? Uh, well, I have the, um, so I did one atmosphere and two atmosphere too, and I found the, the boiling point in the, um, oh yeah, the boiling point basically. And then I found Delta H through, um, equation three and then. So, so one atmospheres or, so if you, you found Delta H, right? Yeah, correct. Yeah. So one atmospheres and the, and you, the normal boiling point is a data point. Your X would be um, your boiling, your temperature and P and your pressure would be um, one atmosphere of pressure. Okay. So just, just by reusing one of the same data, data points that you used in equation three. The, and what I mean by data points is a, as a pressure temperature combination that, that match up. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. No problem.
think I might be confusing myself here, man. Maybe you can boost my confidence. All right, let's hear it. I'm not even sure where to find Delta H. I'm trying to look it up or something. I'm like, ah, I don't know. So you're gonna you're gonna calculate delta H from from a pair of vapor pressures and temperatures. So if you know the boiling point, you're gonna use this equation, equation three. If your boiling point um, at one atmosphere, so if you say, okay, um, P1 is, is normal boiling point. So P1 is one atmosphere and the normal boiling point for ethanol is, is 78 Celsius. So put that in Kelvin and you get 273 plus 78, you get 351. Uh, Sean, are, are you doing this right now? Okay. Is it your question too? I'm just, I've, I went on the symbol lab. I was trying it on my computer and I can't seem to solve for X. <laughs> so I don't know. So if you have everything, if in this version, getting Delta H, um, isn't that bad. Um, Adam or Alexander, what was the boiling point for ethanol for, at two atmospheres? Uh, I got 393 Kelvin. Or oh, that was you got out of water. Sorry. Uh, I just realized all my measurements are in uh, Celsius. So that's what I'm working on right now. Uh, so yeah. what, what was it in Celsius? I found 98.54, which is, which I guess 371.54. Okay. Kelvin. Yeah. I just want to add the 0.15. So we have the P1, T1, P2, and T2. And we're just going to plug this in, and we're trying to solve for delta H. So, I can use so this is going to reduce. <laughs> Go ahead. I was just going to say, I could use Wolfram Alpha or something. I don't have the algebra. No, I, how do you, you could, but it, you know all of the numbers except for delta H. So it's really just arithmetic and you simplify it because you can plug in T1 and T2 and get and turn this whole um, expression in the parentheses reduces just to a, a decimal. Right? And you could do the same thing with the left-hand side when you plug in P1 and P2 and then take natural log of that fraction, you this is just gonna reduce to a number as well, right? So it looks intimidating, but all you're really doing is plugging in numbers and then simplifying, simplifying it. All right, so with those numbers, Try, try and just reduce each of these sections into a decimal as much as you can and see if you can figure out how to simplify to delta H. And I need to step away for 10 minutes uh, and go pick my son up from the bus stop. So I got to go for 10 minutes. I'll be back around 320 and we'll go through this. If you're still hung up on it, we'll, we'll get this solved, okay?
Have you guys found Delta H yet? No? I found something, but it's really big. I don't know if it's right. Are you talking about ethanol or water? Uh, water. Uh, Delta H, yeah, I got uh, 42,238.33. Okay. Yeah, I got something kind of close to that. I wonder I wonder if it varies. Yeah, because um when Sean showed the Excel sheet, his um delta H was really big too. So it's like around the same thing. Yeah, I took a picture of it actually. What was it? Yeah, I did too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um yeah, actually his is bigger than mine and I think bigger than yours too. So yeah, he okay, probably I got bigger temperature oh. or pressure. What? I was just going to say, I got 49,000. So. Oh, okay. Okay. So they're all big. I, I guess it's not like a consistent number. I think it strongly depends on what temperatures we're using. And I think everybody's kind of inconsistent on where we get our temperatures from. Yeah, that would make sense. Okay. Well, good. I'm in the ballpark. Wait, are we just choosing two random temperatures or are we using the boiling point temperatures for one and two? Boiling. Right, so shouldn't we all get the same numbers then? Well, I I feel like I, it depends on where you get it. I feel like some people are giving me different answers. Like uh, two different sources gave me like point, there's just like points off, I think, but you know, might end up mattering when you're dividing by a really small number or something. Oh, okay. I think we should be all in the same ballpark, but I think we, I mean, unless we all use the same numbers, which I would be surprised if that happened. Yeah, I mean, for for water, I used, um, I mean, uh, 100 degrees or 373 Kelvin for one atmosphere and 393 for two. Yeah, I used 390. Oh, okay. All right. And that should affect you a little bit. Pretty sure it should be 393 though. I'm realizing that now I must've done something wrong with my calculator. Um, when Did you guys get the um, uh, entropy yet for water? No, nope, I don't think so. I think everyone else is on step one. Oh, okay. Uh, Cause I got a negative number. I don't know if that's right. Yeah, I did it the first time with Celsius and I did get a negative number. So I'm um, maybe you're right. Yeah, I, I've i got the values from Kelvin, so it should be right. But I ended up getting negative 113.24 if you guys end up getting it.
I don't know, my math might definitely be wrong, but uh, I only got 1.63 positive this time. So let me double check that. For the entropy? Yeah. Oh. Um, looking at the ones that Sean got for his values, um, he got like positive 112.89, which is similar to mine, but just positive instead of negative. Huh. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously I could be wrong. I think I am wrong. I'm going to go through it again. What did you get again for the uh, delta H of water? Uh, I got like 42. 42,000, yeah, 238. Okay. All right, so how'd it go? Um, All right, well, let's work through it. I ended up solving for uh, delta S for water, but then I ended up getting a negative number. I got like negative 113. I don't know if that's that wrong. So you probably missed a negative somewhere in there because going from a liquid to a gas should always be an increase in entropy, right? Because we're getting more random. Oh, yeah, you're right. So reasonableness check on that one is a, is key. So if we if we use the, the data points, uh, hang on. All right, so if I use those data points from the, um, that we had before, and we're using the two, for, two equation, sorry, two point form of the equation. So natural log of P1 over P2 equals negative delta H over R. And let me make sure I don't miss a negative here. T1 over T2, yeah. Or, sorry, 1 over T1 minus 1 over E2. So if we plug everything in there, um, for P1, over P2, we're going to get natural log of 0.5, which is just going to simplify to a number. Negative delta H is what we're solving for. And we're in, we need this to be in energy units. So R is going to be 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin. And our temperatures in Kelvin, 1 over T1 is going to be 351 Kelvin minus 1 over 371 Kelvin. And so That can all be reduced. All right, so that can all be reduced. And when we plug that in, we'll get a number 1 over 351 minus 1 over 
be 71 and get that number winds up being 0 0.000154. Or you can have it in scientific notation, that's fine too. And natural log of 0.5 is negative 0 0.693. All right, so if I, I'm just going to clear off the form of the um, expression at the top. So I have room here. So we have negative 0 0.693 equals negative delta H over 8.314, and that's all times 1.54 times 10 to the minus 4. All right, you see it? I didn't really even do any algebra yet, right? All I did was plug numbers in and simplify. And it's already looking a lot easier to deal with, right? Um, so this that's what I mean when I say, um, just plug the numbers in and simplify, is just do the arithmetic that you can before you worry about, because doing the math to solve for delta H before you plug in the numbers, the algebra winds up getting really tricky. And there's no need to deal with that when we know all of these numbers already. Um, so then, and we can even simplify this further by doing, taking, if we just put this over here, make our, move our 8.314 and put it under that, uh, other fraction, that decimal that we got, because rules of fraction say we can combine that. We saw the Delta H is on top of our fraction but we can simplify that even further. 0. 0.000154 over 8.314. And now we're down to Negative 0 0.693 equals negative delta H time. And then the, the product of doing that division is 1.85 times 10 to the negative 5. divide both sides by that number and bring the negative sign along with it. A one eight one eight four, not one eight five.
right? And then once we do all that, we get a number that seems at least in the right ballpark in terms of joules for, for a reaction. We get um, 37,000 joules or 37 kilojoules, which is a reasonable-ish number for a chemical reaction, right? We're not getting a number in the millions. We're not getting a number in the tens. Getting a number in the tens of thousands of joules is a pretty standard reaction energy. And you should be able to check this if you Google enthalpy of vaporization of ethanol. You can probably find a number and it should agree with this pretty well. It might be off a little bit, um, depending on sig figs, basically. Um, but at the very least, it matches. So I used two different data points when I did this last year. Um, and my two different data points gave me a delta H of 39.7 kilojoules instead of 37.5 kilojoules, which is when we have these exponential relationships, that's close enough for sig figs, really. It's a little bit more off than we would normally like to see it, but exponentials can do that sometimes. Sean, are you going to be grading on that precision of numbers? Because I feel like, yeah, like just a few roundings here and there will change it significantly. Yes, it absolutely will. Um, and no, I'm not going to be that that careful about um, sig figs in this class. You know. This is not a math heavy class. And for the most, there's a lot of uncertainty in all these numbers we're looking up as well, right? So um, just get it, get it close. Um, and you know, keep your sig figs as for for this for a reaction or a calculation that hasn't a um, exponential term in it or a log term in it, I would consider these to be the same within sig figs, the to the same place. Um, and they're only they're off by you know, a larger percentage we would normally like, but still pretty close to the same number. So yeah, don't don't sweat that. So then you use what equation number two to figure out delta S? Bingo. So once we get once we have delta H. Now we have everything for this equation except for delta S. So pick one of those two points. It doesn't matter which one. Pick a vapor pressure and the temperature that goes with it, the boiling point that goes with it, and plug them in for pressure and temperature. And then your, your constant that comes out the other end is your delta S okay. divided by R. Just take a step back. The way that we figured out the boiling point of ethanol at two atmospheres of pressure was just looking it up. Some good old Google. Yep. yep. Cool. So and your so your pressure too might not have been two atmospheres. The like I said, um, I used different data points last year. I looked up ethanol. So here was my my raw data that I looked up. I looked up. Um, the boiling point of ethanol at one atmosphere and the boiling point of ethanol at 0. 0.8486 was the was a number that I was able to find from some reputable source. Um, and I was and I plugged in that boiling point, which was 347.4 Kelvin. So any two points should give you close to the same answer because what we're really solving for when we look at it like this, this is in general, this is the the this is just like a um, linear equation. Y equals m x and b. M is delta h over r. X equals one over temperature. And B is your delta S over R. So just like back in, in basic algebra, you could find 
the slope if you had any two points, right? That's really what we did here is we found the slope by using those two, the difference in height rise over run basically between those two points. And then now we're gonna find the intercept by taking one of those points and plugging it back in. Definitely off to a rocky start here, but I'll give it a shot. It's been a long time since we've done some math uh, in this class. So you're not alone in that. Give it your best go. I'm going to stop recording. I was uh, didn't realize we were still recording here. <laughs>